welcome to the Jordan Maxwell Show. Jordan Maxwell has been an esoteric scholar and a preeminent researcher in the fields of astrotheology and religion for 52 years. He is well respected by thousands of open minded free thinkers around the globe, many of which have been waiting for years for him to do his own show. It's finally his time. Jordan has been studying a plethora of interesting, thought provoking subject matter his entire life. He's been teaching seminars, giving speeches, writing books, and basically sharing his wisdom all over the planet. The objective of the Jordan Maxwell Show is for Jordan to share what he's learned in his lifetime with everybody who cares to listen for free. So help Jordan spread the word. Repost this link and share it with your friends. You can find all the podcast episodes on our website at jordanmaxwellshow.com where you can also find links to both Facebook and Twitter. You can subscribe to The Jordan Maxwell Show on iTunes. Just search for The Jordan Maxwell Show. The objective of the show is to give Jordan a free form in a social setting amongst friends on his own schedule. He'll lead us through a matrix of politics, history, religion, biology, and astrology, among other topics, in his own way, on his own time, and at his own pace. As time goes on, we will narrow in on more specific topics and host many special guests. Jordan, what did you want to accomplish on this show? I want to do this show because I want to make it available. See, when I was growing up, I wanted to know. I wanted. I was into everything. I was researching and studying everything I could get my hands on, and I wanted to know. I wanted knowledge. And so I really appreciated, more than anyone will know, I really appreciated speakers, teachers, authors, writers, people who were the leading authorities in, the, in that day that I could go to and listen, go to seminars and sit and listen to them and learn from them and write down their, their, bio, you know, their, their, uh, their sources of their information and go back and get the books and read. So I was traveling all over California and all the museums and all the, the federal and state depositories, all kinds of research libraries. I lived out at UCLA and USC stacks. They would call them the stacks at UC, USC, uh, underground libraries, for years and years and years, cross-referencing everything, reading everything I could on the occult, on, on, on the strange things that going on in the world. And I, like I said, I was meeting all kinds of off-the-wall characters who were blowing my mind with stories about all sorts of interesting things. And these people were all well-grounded. Highly intelligent military people, scientists, physicists, astronauts. Well, it's like they say, when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. That's it. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Excellent. That's what we're doing here. I just want to wake people up, and I'm so tired of hearing radio that does nothing but just pour out slop into the public trough, as we're just shrill, feeding the pigs. It just feed the pigs, you pour some slop into the public trough, and it's called radio, and it's all about dope and loud music and craziness and stupidity and ignorance and then politics and religion and commerce. I, I have always wanted to hear a radio show that damn well tells you something that's really important, intellectually and spiritually gratifying. And nothing out there on radio today is either spiritually gratifying or makes any sense. It's all a bunch of bullshit. I know it, and everybody else knows it. I want to produce a program that's based on really interesting people. You have no idea in the world the kind of people I know, and that I'm going to bring on this show that are going to blow your mind. So I want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here to listen to me, because I'm telling you, it's a very interesting world we live in. Uh, it's a pleasure, Jordan. Yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. If we can cover one-tenth, if we can get one-tenth of the people in here that uh, we've, we've talked about, Oh, it's, just, the, uh, yeah. it's just sharing the wisdom. Really, that's the key for future generations to kind of look you at know, those point young to, people today have no basis for it. They have nothing to build on. Yeah. They haven't been given anything. And also, this is what Dick Gregory said. He said, Americans love talking about how we have the right to elect our leaders. We can go to the polls and elect our leaders, but you can't select your leader. Yeah, we get two choices. You get two, two choices. choices. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, Abbott or Costello? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Mutt and Jeff. Yeah. Laurel and Hardy. You it's, either have one of the two. Which one of these thugs do you want? Because yeah. they both work uh, for uh, me. Don't, don't get me going on politics. Oh, uh, man. Politics is, is yeah. At least American politics. Yeah. You know, it's, it's got a him. hell of a story, American politics. Yeah. But, you know, I think, listen, there is hope. Well, like I you said, know. there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a train coming. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and as you know, you've lived all over and experienced all kinds of cultures. America still is the finest country on the planet. America was the greatest thing that ever happened on yeah. the face of the earth. I love my country. I love the idea of being free. But I'm telling you, unless and until the young people, don't look to the older people to do anything. They're too stupid and too old and too dim-witted. And the people with money, they're not about to do anything. People with money are not about no, to give you a it. nickel to help yeah. you do anything to save the human race. I will guarantee you that. The, the guys with the big money in Hollywood, they're not about to give you a nickel. No, so the only pay. hope that there's any hope at all is young people who have the vitality and the, and the, uh, and the energy. I don't have the vitality and I, I don't have the energy. I've got the experience, the knowledge, and the wisdom of some 53 years of being in the world of the occult. And uh, so that's why I just want to share with young people who want to know. Because, God, this world is so fascinating when you really oh, it's amazing. begin. To... It really is a beautiful yeah. place. And it's a journey, and we're only here for a short time. And the key is, is making every day count. Yeah, I know. I mean, I love talking about my experiences and the things I'm interested in. Because I want the young people in the audience to get enthralled with the stories that I'm telling them. I've been doing what I do for 53 years. I started back in 1959 with talking at little mom and pop grocery stores and bookstores. And I was just fascinated with the world of the occult, with, with all the things that are not seen. I don't know why I just gravitated toward the dark side on everything. No matter what was happening in the world, I always knew that there was more to the story yet. You know, there's something else going on that you don't see. One of the themes of the old Masonic Order of Knights Templars became very famous, as above, so below. So I always applied that to everything happening on the earth. Whatever's happening on the earth, there's got to be a reason. And uh, I don't buy for one minute that Things just happen. No, things don't just happen. Things are caused by people who make them happen. I learned I wanted to know, and that's the big thing. The emphasis is on the word want. I wanted to know. So I decided to dedicate my life to studying the occult. The word occult simply is a Latin word which means hidden doesn't mean it's evil or bad or of the devil. It just means hidden. And so I realized, as I said, even growing up as a small kid, I already realized that nothing is what it seems. There's always a reason for everything. And almost never do people see the reason for things. They just, things happen, and so we react to when things happen. I've lived a whole life of strange, off-the-wall experiences. And every time I think it's over, no, it, it's coming back bigger. Just beginning. Just, just beginning. I've done over 600 radio interviews. I've uh, worked with CBS on the Ancient Mystery Series. I spoke all around the world, all over the earth. i uh, traveled extensively, speaking about the world of the occult. And I'm fascinated with how much people don't know. <laughs> I've had 36 peak experiences in my life. I'll give you an example of the kind of thing that happens to me. And back in 1992-93, I was asked to speak at a conference in Pasadena at a large hotel. There would be about, I don't know, at least 500 people in the audience. And so about a week before, I went out there with the two guys who were putting the conference on. Uh, Gary Schultz and Norio Hayakawa from Japan uh, were putting this UFO, you know, alien conference on, and I was going to be the keynote speaker. But we went out to the hotel about a week before to kind of spy out the hotel and see what we were going to do. 
Norio asked me, he said, when you come up on the platform, what are you going to need? Are you going to be doing a slide presentation or a blackboard or what? And I told him, no, I don't need anything. All I want is a table and a chair because I want to be able to lay all the documents out that I'm talking about. And I just want to be like a teacher in front of a class. I don't need anything special. So he said to me, he said, all right, then I'll tell you what we'll do then. We'll have somebody sitting behind you on a on a bar stool with a video camera over your shoulder so that when you're talking about a document, hold it up knowing that they're going, he's going to zoom in on it and we'll have closed circuit TV so people can see what you're reading. And so that next Saturday, it came off great. I did two hour presentation on UFOs and alien stuff and all kinds of occult subjects and it went off fine. That night when we were leaving, the event, the guy who was filming me, sitting behind me on the stage, he asked me, he said, Jordan, could you come over tonight for dinner? My wife and I would like to have you come over. And he lived right there in the city in Pasadena. I said, sure. So we go over there. He's uh, got a really nice condo. The wife is in the kitchen fixing dinner, and he and I are sitting in the front room talking about all kinds of strange stuff. After a while, she comes out of the kitchen and says to him in front of me, she said, have you told him yet? And he said, no, I wasn't going to tell him till after dinner. And I thought to myself, oh, God, not again. I don't like <laughs> surprises. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, what do you mean you were going to tell me? Tell me what? And he said, we had an ulterior motive for inviting you here. He said, I've told the story to so many people over the last many years, and my wife has heard it so many times. Now I'm going to tell you the story. He said, I just turned 50 years old. And when I was 17 years old, I was back on the East Coast. And one morning, I was out of school for the summer, and I was thumbing my way north to stay with my cousin. And he said, an old man picked me up at a pickup truck. And he said, the, the truck was filthy, dirty, falling apart. And the old man looked to be at least 90 years old. And he said, but at least it's a ride. So he says, when I got in, this old man began to tell me everything about me and my family. He was absolutely correct. He knew everything about my dad's job, my mother, her friends, my, my sister. The whole time we're driving, he was telling me all about my life. Deja um, yeah, and how I'm doing in school, what my sister's boyfriend's doing, and how my dad's doing in business. And he said, everything he was telling me was exactly right. And he said, I was amazed as a kid, who is this old man in this dirty, beat-up truck that was telling me this stuff? And he says, and when we stopped, when he let me out, he said, everything I've told you up to now was to entertain you and get your attention. Now I'm going to tell you something important. After you're 50 years old, you're going to be on the other side of this country. And one morning, you're going to be on a stage with a man sitting at a table with a lot of papers. And you're going to have a camera. That technology does not exist, but it will then. And you're going to have a camera sitting behind him over his shoulder so that when he picks up the paper to talk about, you will be able to hit it with the camera so that people in the audience will be able to see what he's talking about. Now, when that happens, you tell the guy sitting there, that you're filming, you tell him, I said that I put him at that table. He's sitting at that table doing what I want him to do. That was not his idea to sit at that table. It's my idea. I put him there. And he says, so this morning I'm sitting there filming you, and it finally dawned on me because I was so interested in getting everything ready, I wasn't thinking. And he said, I looked in the audience, I looked at my wife, and she was staring at me. Today, the prophecy was fulfilled. It was like 17 years ago. And the old man just told me to tell you that he put you there. That's not your idea. He wanted you there. That frightened me so that I got up and left. And I remember walking out at night, and I walked out to the street, and I was shaking. I was frightened. And he came out and walked with me. And I said, I don't understand what's happening. And he said, all I'm telling you is what the man said. So somebody knew what you were going to do 17 years ago when they told me. And he said it wouldn't be until after I turned 50. That's just one of many experiences. I, 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 because I would had so many experiences before that, it was just one more devastating blow that tells me that nobody, it doesn't seem to me that anybody is in control of anything. 
the thing about that particular story that really strikes me is the fact that he knew a particular camera did not exist then. How did he know that that camera was a technology that didn't exist? That implies that all this technology we're being given, we're being given. Somebody is giving the human race technology, high, incredibly intelligent technological advances. Somebody is giving it to us. I've sat with, you know, I don't know how much I can say on radio, and this has always been my problem is when I'm on radio, I, I have to watch what I say because there are other people's lives are involved and, and you know, I don't, I don't want to cause other people problems in life but by telling stories out of school. But uh, <laughs> I've been told some really incredible stuff from very important people in this world. I mean, and profoundly important people in this world that you would not think that I had an opportunity to even be in their company and the, what they told me. Um, well, we've, we've, you know, collectively have sat down with some of those folks. That's right. Remember the gentleman who introduced us and that's right. his involvement with, know, the with the government for years and years At and the years. very, very pinnacle of government. Mm -hmm. Pinnacle of government. Right. I remember him telling me, Netanyahu works for me. I remember the night he said that. Netanyahu, Kissinger, no, they work for me. Well, I remember he invited me over to his house that day after September 11th in the World Trade Center. I went over to his office and sitting in his office amongst all the photographs yep. of him and every world <laughs> the diplomat out there on the planet, including several presidents. Oh, and, yeah. And, and Queen Mum and Prince Charles and all these royalty of Europe. He was, mm -hmm. he had pictures with everybody. Yeah. And I remember having uh, the discussions. You and I had some very interesting Shabbat dinners at his house. That's and, right. Uh, we sure did. You know, he shared a lot of his wisdom and explained And how, if anybody had it, he did. I mean, he oh, was... Yeah. He yeah. was one of the top people in this government. And sharp as a tech. Remember, oh, yeah. At 92 years old, he was sharper than half the 20 year olds oh, at the God, table. Yeah. Brilliant man. Yeah, great guy. Well, I don't, I don't know if I ever told you this, but in 1999, uh, December 31st, uh, New Year's night, the next morning, uh, New Year's morning of the year 2000, I got a phone call from him. And I said, well, you know, what a pleasure to hear from you. And he said, well, I'm just calling to wish you a happy new year. And I said, well, thank you for thinking of me. And he said, of course I think of you. You're my friend. And so I could hear he was in a restaurant. So I said, so where are you? And he said, well, I'm having breakfast uh, with the, uh, with my wife. He said, uh, she wanted to come to Palm Springs for the weekend, for the holiday weekend. So I brought her over here and we're having breakfast. I said, well, that's nice. And so he said, I'm here having breakfast with uh, Secretary Powell and Dick Cheney. And they want to say hello. And, <laughs> and yeah, he's there with Powell and Cheney. And he said, I've been talking to them about you and about my feelings about you. I was just amazed. And so we talked and I talked to his wife for a few minutes. And then uh, that was it. And so then when she handed the phone back to him, he said, well, uh, uh, you will be coming to dinner next next week. And I said, yes, I will, Doc. Uh, yes, I will. And he said, well, I've been talking to Paul and Cheney about you. And uh, so I've told them about my feelings about you. And I said, well, I hope it's good. And he says, oh, always, I love you, and we'll talk later. So I said, well, thank you. So that was it. But, you know, Paul and Cheney sitting there oh, yeah. discussing me. I'll never forget the call when his... His aide came in and said, Dr. Kissinger's on the phone. Would you like to take his call? And he and Henry Kissinger had a five-minute conversation about mm -hmm. yeah. how the world was about to change after that day. That's exactly right. And he told me, he said, there are seven men who run California. One of those sessions where we were up in his, up in his office, mm -hmm. in his home, uh, and our other mutual friend, the other doctor, mm -hmm was there and uh, and and so he said to me he said there are seven men who run the state of california one of them is in charge of all entertainment one is over agriculture one is over uh the mineral resources of california another one's over the corporations and uh, international corporation but basically the power of california is in the hands of seven men and they work directly for me i hired them I don't know what that tells you, but what translated it seems like means you know, this guy was calling the shots for California. Not only was he doing it, but he's calling up for in Washington D.C. because he had he told me he, uh, uh, one of his actual words were, "Not Yahoo works for me." That's amazing. 
he and I, as you well know, because you were there, he and I became very, very close friends. And there was a third one in our triumvirate, who was a doctor who was also with us in that time. And I'm telling you, I sat and talked with him about world politics, about world religion. And, uh, oh, very fascinating. Oh, he was, absolutely. Uh, yeah, very good mentor, I think, for all of us. He was, he uh, was absolutely a well, wonderful that, mentor for all of us. Well, I, mean, I think that sort of goes back to the show is uh, he, at the age of 90, 91, 92, was sharing a lot of his worldly wisdom yeah. to potentially make this a better place. Mm -hmm. and, That's uh, what he wanted to know, do. Sharing the wisdom is really, the, I think, the cornerstone to uh, the show where you're giving a palette to go out and uh, share experiences, life experiences. And I think uh, seeing that people, knowledge is power. That's it. And, and Knowledge is power. Absolutely. And, and the symbolism within everyday society. I'll notice on, uh, I've traveled the world uh, extensively from Brazil to Europe to Asia to you name it. Getting into the symbols, which you've really opened my eyes to. They're symbols, and these yeah. symbols have been around for an awfully long time. And they're, and they're in your face. They're right there in your face. Every, everywhere well, you go. Well, look, at, you know, walk into a uh, courtroom or look at the state seal, and, you oh, know, yeah. they're, they're right there on the wall. That's right. You know, the old saying, read between the lines. That's right. And, uh, and read the fine print. Yeah. You know, read the fine print. But, uh, before you sign the contract, read the fine print. What are you talking about? And sign on the dotted line. Yep. Well, Sign on the dotted line and read the fine print go together. Because yeah. when you're signing a check, if you have a checkbook, look in your checkbook. And where you signed your name, it looks like small dots. So therefore, you're signing on the dotted, dotted line. line. Okay, but get a magnifying glass. It's not dots. It's small, tiny print. That's why the attorneys tell you, read the fine print. Right. The fine print is on the on your check where you're signing your check. And so read the fine print. Yep. And so when you get a magnifying glass and look at that line you're signing on, it's not a dotted line. They're not dots, they're letters and it's spelling out something. Mm -hmm. Very interesting the way the banking, you know, does what they do to us. Well, the banking system. Well, that's the the irony of the banking world, you look at the control that they have. Over everything. You know, printing everything. And you know, it's funny that if you look at uh, four countries that are considered uh, the biggest threat, if you look at North Korea, if you look at Iran, if you look at Cuba, and uh, even Venezuela, and those aren't the four countries that have nothing to do with, quote unquote, the Rothschild banking. You know, they have their own sort of way of... Uh, monetization there's not not control over the central bank system yeah and that's that's why they're the enemy but um uh you know this whole idea of banking and i've always loved the the uh, as i said the dark the dark side especially in relation to ufos and ancient mysteries and who built the pyramids and where do these ancient monoliths and uh you know huge stones um I've been to Egypt three times. I spoke in Cairo three different times. And we went to the pyramids. And uh, I, I have to say that we were right across the street from the pyramids. We stayed. And so every night we would just sit out in the on the uh, patio upstairs. It was six stories up. And on the patio, we'd look right across the street at the Sphinx. It was right there. And then right behind it on the, on the Giza Plateau, the plateau above it was the the pyramids and so every night there was a uh, light show light music show we'd sit out there on the on you know, seven stories up on the on the roof uh watching the show every night but um the the pyramids are strange uh, for me uh i was not as impressed with the pyramids as i thought i would be Although you, do, and the reason why I think is because your mind does not comprehend, even when you're looking at them across the street, your mind does not comprehend how big these things really are. Until you get there, you drive up, you know, it's about two or three blocks and you have to drive up there to the Giza Plateau. Well, they're right there in front of you, but wait till you get there. Then you begin to see how large they really are. And that's very impressive. But the thing that blows my mind is when you go inside the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid is not the middle one. 
The middle one is the one that everyone always sees. No, that's not the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's the one before it is the Great Pyramid of Giza. The one in the middle is very impressive, but that's not, in point of fact, the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And when you go inside the Great Pyramid, uh, it's a it's a mind trip. What the, I'm just amazed at the size of the stones inside that gallery when you're climbing up the gallery, walking up this long. Have you ever been in the I Great? I've not been there yet. No. Oh, it's incredible! Absolutely. Yeah. Road trip. It, yeah, it's it's a it's yeah. a mind trip inside well, how old the do you Great think Pyramid. They really are because there's a lot of controversy. Oh, over the true absolutely, age of the... lots of controversy. Well, the the um, the Egyptians told Herodotus that that they had no idea who built the pyramids. So when Herodotus, the Greek historian, that was back I don't know before uh, Alexander the Great or right around that time, when the Greeks went into Egypt. The, the people that were not Egyptians, they were Arabic, but they told uh, Herodotus, we don't know who built them. I have no idea. Uh, well, even the Great Pyramid, they say they're, they're even finding controversy of what it really was. And Oh, yeah. And yeah there's never, I'll tell you one thing we know for sure, that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And the one thing we know for sure that it wasn't is what, the, is what all of our schools teach that it was. And well, that is the, the Great Pyramid... Uh, all three pyramids were tombs for the pharaohs. Not true. That is as, as ludicrous on the face of it. Just on the face of it, that's stupidity. Anybody who would make a statement like that in public well, should be ashamed of well, themselves. Well, now they're coming out saying that the Great Pyramid was a potential power uh, generator of some oh, sort. Oh, well, you know, anything. But, but tell me that it was a, a tomb. Mm -hmm. Anyone more than 500 brain cells all going the same way will tell you that the, the pharaohs were buried about 25 miles south of there in a place called the Valley of, of the, the Kings. kings. Yep. That's where the pharaohs are buried. There's no pharaohs or anybody buried in any pyramids, and they were not tombs to start with. So when you understand that the three, and you just mentioned it, those three pyramids at a particular time um, of the year, uh, the Orion's Orion. belt mm -hmm. is directly overhead. And Orion's belt is three very bright stars, but one of them is a little off center. The last one's a little off center. The other two are in straight line, but the, other, the third one is a little one, and it's off centered a little bit. That's exactly what the pyramids are the two great pyramids, and then there's a third pyramid, which is a little off center. Well, it, it, it coincides with the, the Orion's belt exactly, perfect. So what I'm saying is that the pyramids were uh, anything but a burial tombs. No, there was nobody buried in those tombs. Well, look, nobody. and they—they they all the same ones. You know, the Mayans. They also look at the same uh, thing. The, well, the, the Indians, exactly. the Indian uh, temples, and uh, the one I found fascinating. We were discussing earlier is uh, off the coast of Cuba, two miles under the surface of the uh, ocean. Yeah, they've been able to find a duplicate of the same Giza plateau with the pyramids to scale yeah and uh they also line up with orion well and what about the and, and what about the uh, the pyramid that's found on the on the floor of the atlantic ocean uh right off the coast of florida there's a big pyramid sitting out on the floor of the atlantic ocean now people don't know about it it's because uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with football or, or sports or <laughs> basketball. So what the hell is a, a, no, how, how, how the hell important could it be? It's just a pyramid sitting out there on the damn ocean floor. Well, how do you find out about it? Yeah, well, the way the the way it was found is that one of the doctors that worked at the uh, from the story I heard is that he was um, worked at the Oceanographic Institute in Miami, I think it is. And he was flying his own plane with a friend one day out over the Bahama Banks, which is 10 miles north of the island of Bimini and the Bermuda Triangle. Mm -hmm. 10 miles north of Bimini is, a, is an area called the Bahama Banks. And he was flying out over that area. And the sun, he said, was at an exact uh, uh, angle that he could see into the ocean because usually it's just reflecting off the ocean. You can't see anything. But if you hit it at the right moment, the sun is at a particular angle. You can see into the ocean. And he said, and as they were flying over, they saw a pyramid that looked like a pyramid, the size of Cheops pyramid in, in Egypt. Hmm. So they marked it where, where they were and came back and they went back out there. 
with uh, with uh, I don't know with the the Oceanographic Institute and probably the po Coast Guard. I don't know who else went out there with him, but uh, they went back out there and they swam down, and they found this pyramid and it has an all-seeing eye at the top, and they discovered that the eye or the opening at the top of the triangle, the top of the pyramid, was sucking in water. And it says it was sucking it in and it was blowing it out the bottom. So there's some kind of a generator actually operating right now in this pyramid that's on the ocean floor uh, of, the, of the Atlantic, 10 miles north of Bimini in an area called the Bahama Banks. And he said that the doctor, I think his name was Ballantyne with a B, Dr. Ballantyne uh, with the Oceanographic Institute. Anyway, he said, and this was incidentally on Discovery or History Channel, there was an art, and there was a show on this. Mm -hmm. Shocked me, but I didn't, you know, I was amazed to see it, but there was a whole program well, they do on such this. such great jobs on some of the Yeah, programs. because normally they don't put on highly intelligent shows, but, uh, but this one was very interesting. But he said that when they were, he was swimming with other people, they were all swimming around this pyramid, he says it's at least as high as the Great Pyramid of Giza, the big one. And he said, but he swam into the eye at the top. He mm -hmm. swam into it. And he said, and there were two hands, that were a little larger than normal human hands, that were suspended in space. As, they, as he swam in, these two hands were suspended. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and they were made out of, he felt they were made out of pewter or some kind of metal hands and they were holding a crystal and he said i popped the crystal out of the hands and he said the hands are just suspended in space you've seen that actually in the a lot of the uh architecture of the time you'll see that with the with the double the hands. two hands the double hands double yeah, hand holding something together holding right. something well that's a kind of getting back to the pyramid here you'll oh see yeah the, yeah i know i mean when people look at the people look at a dollar bill and have no idea in the world what, what they're looking at Maybe this is a good place to break. We could talk a very long time about symbols on the dollar bill. So there's going to be a lot of different guests, and many of them have their own books and articles that they've written, or and or videos that they have uh, produced, their seminars, etc. And so when I'm uh, introducing these people to you, uh, you'll want to uh, get maybe their books and your, their, their videos, etc. So you can get all of that, of course, at Amazon, because Amazon carries a lot of the uh, articles and the books and videos that I'll be talking about. And uh, you're learning from the best of the best teachers. We have a deal with Amazon, and it's very simple. If you like what we're doing here and you want to support Jordan and this show, you just go to Amazon. By clicking the Amazon link on our homepage, doing your online shopping, and Amazon will support us and it won't cost you anything more. Well, people, there's a lot to learn and we need to wake up. Thank you for the support.